right here raised on these pews. Grew up in boys club, and youth group, and young adult ministry. A few years ago, Pastor Steve Malone, now pastoring in Seattle, Washington, and his wife responded to the call of God and went to Roatan, Honduras. And going with them was Stephen and Rachel Jones. And at the time, were a young couple from this church. They had been serving a mission in Missoula, Montana, and had come home. And Stephen had uh, gotten a job in the downtown of the state capitol, working with Governor Schwarzenegger in a particular department in the governor's office. And I was on a path of uh, success in business and a future career with opportunities presenting themselves. And uh, the call of God was heavily upon he and his wife. And uh, through a series of discussions and prayer, they decided to go with the Malones to Roatan, Honduras, to a country they'd never been, to a place that spoke a language they didn't know. And uh, they were 23, 24 years old at the time. After being there for around six months, Brother Malone, our lead missionary, had a heart attack. And this church knows well. Most of you know the story of how he had to be life flighted over to the mainland and his life was saved and then uh, had to come home, leave the mission field and was, was in Southern California a while with his family before coming back to Sacramento. Uh, and then after healing, uh, assumed the pastorate in Seattle. But what none of us prepared for or thought about was there was a 23 and 24 year old couple that were left alone. Uh, not only the weight of an island that didn't know God upon them, but the weight of an, un or an incomplete building project that was uh, is now valued at about 1.5 million or something to that effect. And uh, Brother Stephen was not a contractor. He had done, I guess, apprentice work helping some people, but it was a lesson in hard knocks and how the weight of all that fell upon him. But greatness sometimes is just revealed by pressure. And Stephen and Rachel Jones got under the burden of that thing and not only completed that project, but built and grew a church. And after being there, they felt it was the will of God to uh, come back to the United States where they were uh, working with us. As you remember, they were uh, pastoring with us in our vertical church that is now pastored by Brother Pizarro. Amen. And uh, they were there, and it was it was a season where where God began to do some things in their life, and spoke to me. And I approached Brother Jones and said, Brother Stephen, what what are you feeling to do? And he said, I just feel like I'm supposed to evangelize. And I said, Well, you don't survive in the evangelistic field by feeling. There has to be an open door. And I said, If it is the will of God, that door will open. That was on, I believe, Friday. On Monday, I received three phone calls from pastors that said, hey, I was praying. I felt like God spoke to me to have the Joneses. Are they available? And it was from that point that they began to itinerate across the United States. And for the last number of years, they have done that. And they have been very, very successful. I've had pastors tell me that it has been the greatest revival of their church. Uh, God began to deal with them about a year ago about going back to Roatan, and uh, they left a very successful path of ministry. Uh, already churches were asking for them to pastor their churches, but they felt the call of God to go back to the mission field, and uh, they are doing an incredible work, and I'm going to let him tell you about some of the things. Let me just tell you, God's hand is on Stephen and Rachel Jones and their two beautiful little boys. Rock Church, do you love the Jones family? They're back home today. Would you stand with me, Brother Stephen? We love you. We're proud of you. Come do what you feel in the Holy Ghost. Amen. Why don't we give the Lord the best hand clap of praise we've given him all night? Hallelujah. We serve an awesome God. 
God. Amen. Do you believe that? We serve a powerful God. Amen. The Bible says that he's a jealous God. The Bible says that his name is jealous. He's not envious. He's jealous. Envious would mean that he wants what you have. But you don't have anything God doesn't already own. He's jealous because he's the all in all. He's the rose of Sharon. He's the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. He's Alpha and Omega. He's the great and everlasting father. He's the righteous judge. He's the lily of the valley. He's all of those things. He's everything you need him to be. And still, we worship other gods. And that's why he's jealous. Because everything you need is in him. But not on a Sunday night at the Rock Church in Sacramento, California. We didn't come to worship a little G. We came to worship a big G. Did anybody come to lift up the name of Jesus? Did anybody come to magnify the name of Jesus? Hallelujah. I'm honored to be home. Be among our favorite people in all of the world. And share just briefly what God is doing on the island of Roatan, Honduras. Sister Ashley, did you get a chance to get that video? Is that a, a thumbs up or a thumbs down? Why don't you go ahead and play that first in Jesus' name? You may be seated. Underneath our building, 
a 30,000 gallon system to supply water for the rest of the building. This is the greatest need right now. Uh, we're going, we're trying to complete this building in, in phases. This is the immediate need. Uh, we need to raise support, to lay rebar, to lay block, to pour a concrete slab. The question is, will you partner with us? Will you help us get this finished so we can move on to the rest of the sanctuary and fill this up in Jesus' name? Maybe God does it this way on purpose. When he puts it in the heart of a man to go to a place but in my opinion, there is not a more fertile harvest in all the world than on the island of Rotan in the country of Honduras. Partner with us. Help us to reach Rotan and change this place with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. If you want to see a revival in Honduras, would you clap your hands to the Lord? Like it's already done. Hallelujah. I know that Sister Zotsman has a few other pictures. I'll briefly move through uh, as quickly as I can. Uh, if you have those prepared. Uh, it's amazing to see. And, and I couldn't take credit for everything God is doing on the island. The, uh, the ministry has existed in Honduras for six years. It's hard to believe six years ago God opened the door. And um, I would be foolish to say that I'm responsible for everything that has happened. But we have arrived. I, I explain it to people like this. For the first five or six years, we were sowing seed. And uh, sometimes it took and then sometimes it didn't. But we are just arriving at the place now where we are beginning to to reap the harvest of those seeds that were planted. Um, this is a picture of um, the blueprint of what the sanctuary will eventually look like when it's completed. There have been a few modifications to that blueprint, but uh, it gives you a general idea of what uh, we are looking to achieve. You can move on to the next slide. Here is a picture of, of progress on the first phase up at the top there. Uh, block walls are going up. Even since I've been in the States for the last couple of days, they've, they've made significant progress. So things are moving right along. There you can, you can hardly see it, but they've poured some of the vigas and the arches in the front of the building to make it look pretty. You can keep, keep moving. Here is the cistern. The walls are going up. This was taken yesterday, so progress is being made. We, uh, we launched a new church. This is our La Colonia Sanctuary, just 20 by 20, beautiful green walls. We love that. It's our favorite part. This is our uh, French Harbor location. We launched our first service last week. Had 45 people in attendance. This is a picture of today. I got that picture a couple hours ago. 45 people in service today seeking the Holy Ghost. Uh, it's an amazing thing. This is a school that recently contacted us to teach 75 high school students the Bible for an hour every Monday afternoon. We didn't look for them, they looked for us. It's amazing that the doors of God is open. Here is a man named Giovanni. He opened the door in the French Harbor, got baptized in Jesus' name, completely remodeled the sanctuary where we are renting our facility. He's becoming a loyal pillar in the church there. And uh, there are some amazing things happening. The, the church is beginning to galvanize. For, for years it was a little fluid and it was difficult to bring it all together. But there is an apostolic identity that is being established on the island of Rotan Honduras. Brother Johnny King came to me last week. He said, Stephen, it is no exaggeration. I believe in the next 10 years the apostolics can literally take over that island. We've got a church in Crawfish Rock. We've got a church in French Harbor. We're starting another church in Coxon Hole. We've got one in Sandy Bay. Somebody shout hallelujah. And Brother Babino has, he spent a week with us a couple weeks ago. He lent us his daughter for a year or however, however long that turns into. I'm praying she just takes over. She becomes our our music pastor in Jesus' name. I know he's not wanting that, but we claim it. And then Brother Austin Heady, we worked him to death. I know normally when he's home, his dad takes it easy on him, but we worked him hard in Honduras. And uh, I'm thankful for the support of the local church. It, it wouldn't be possible without the Rock Church. 
It wouldn't be possible without the vision of Brother Wilson, Brother Young, and the auxiliary ministry that makes this church what it is. And so from my wife, our family, and the ministry in Rotan, Honduras, we wanted to say thank you for your contribution to the ministry and your vision for what God is doing in that country. I see Brother Buxton here. He came and spent a couple days, poured a slab for us, and uh, we worked him like a Honduran. Amen. He worked pretty good. God's helping us, and in preparation for tonight's service, I, I won't be long, but it's a Sunday night, so we might as well preach a little bit. I want to talk about uh, what God gave me for tonight, and hopefully I can incorporate some of what God is doing on the island and, and lift your faith in Jesus' name. If you'd stand to your feet all over the house, I won't be long, I promise. If you can turn with me to the book of 1 John, chapter number 3. Verse number one and verse number two. Give honor to Pastor, Sister Young, their family, Bishop, Sister Wilson. Amen. I'm just honored to be here. It's a privilege to live for God. Amen. I uh, came home. I flew in Saturday night into Atlanta. You'd think the first thing we would do is go find a cheeseburger or a good steak. We were just happy to have smooth pavement on the highway. <laughs> You take that for granted, I promise you. And I'm walking on carpet right now. This is like foreign. My boys took their shoes off and put their feet in their grandparents' carpet. They didn't know what to do with themselves. <laughs> carpet is a novelty. And uh, God bless the USA. First John chapter number three, verse number one. If you're there, say amen. amen. If you're not, say hold on. You're in Deuteronomy. You're a long ways from the will of God right now. <laughs> First John chapter number three, verse number one. Behold, what manner of love hath the Father bestowed upon us that should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. It doth not yet appear what we shall be. For the next few minutes on a Sunday night, I just want to preach to you from this thought. Don't bury me. I'm not dead yet. Don't bury me. I'm not dead yet. Would you lift your hands as high as you can? Put your Bible down behind you. Would you honestly pray sincerely that God would touch this service? That God would open your heart, your mind to receive what God has for us. Come on, lift your voice. Let there be an apostolic authority that sweeps across this sanctuary. God, I love you. I thank you for the presence of God we feel already. We are believing for a miraculous demonstration of the supernatural in this house. And we will not fail to give you all the praise and all of the glory. Would you clap your hands with expectancy? God bless you for standing. You may be seated. One of the greatest stories and accounts of the ministry of Jesus Christ after his death, burial, and resurrection is the encounter with those disciples that had locked themselves in a house, shut the door, pulled up the blinds. The Bible says for fear of the Jews. Maybe they had already heard that they were being accused of stealing the missing body of Jesus Christ. Men had not hesitated to crucify their teacher. And these men were not likely to hesitate in hunting them down and taking them out. So the Bible tells us that the door is firmly shut and the windows are locked tight. And at least this gives them this uh, sense of security. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, without notification, Jesus is standing in their midst. And it was their Lord. He had conquered death. He was alive. He was substantial. He was real. And the transformation from being fearful to being gleeful was very swift. The Bible says, and the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. All of a sudden, the situation had changed. They uh, were, were fearful of the Jews. And now, why should they be 
fearful of the Sanhedrin and the Sadducees or, or Pilate or even the angry mob because now Jesus is alive. So come what may. However, there was one particular disciple who uh, was affectionately known as Doubting Thomas. He, he earned this distinction because of his absolute refusal to believe that Jesus Christ had resurrected from the dead. Thomas exclaims, really? You expect me to believe that? I will not believe until I see his nail prints. I will not believe until I see the spear marks in his side. All of a sudden, upon that command, Jesus turns to Thomas and petitions him to place your hands in my wounds, the wounds in my sides, and examine the prints in my hands. To which Thomas replies, my Lord and my God. Thomas had arrived at a place of revelation and a place of understanding. And Jesus tells Thomas, Thomas, because thou hast seen, thou hast believed. But blessed are those who have not seen, but still believe. In other words, Jesus was saying, there is a special blessing for those that don't see, but still believe. Ladies and gentlemen at the Rock Church on a Sunday night, I want to preach to you that there is a blessing for you when you believe the things you cannot see right now. I know you're going through tests, tests of your faith, tests of your peace, tests of your calling, tests of your character, tests upon tests, and you're fighting it and facing it and dealing with it. You're wondering if it's all going to pan out. I've come to preach to you on a Sunday night. Keep believing because there is a special blessing. There is a unique blessing for you when you don't see how and you don't see when and you don't see where, but you still believe that God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all. He's got the, the breastplate of 
righteousness. He's got the shield of faith. His feet are shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. God is wearing it. But God is wearing one additional piece that Paul doesn't bring up. The Bible says that the Lord wears vengeance like a garment. And you think it's an accident that the apostle Paul left it out? No, I don't believe that. Because the Bible says vengeance is mine. You just keep believing and let God vindicate you. The battle is not yours, but it's mine, saith the Lord. I wear vengeance. If you wear it, you'll self-destruct. You just fight and let me defend you. You just keep believing. You just keep believing. You just keep believing. forgot familiar things like watering his plants or until he started to forget faces. His muscles wasted away. And his limbs became spastic. His hands and his feet curled in on themselves like claws. He was completely unresponsive. He was treated for tuberculosis and then meningitis, but no conclusive diagnosis was made. Medication after medication, nothing worked. They even traveled, his family traveled internationally to seek expert advice, and they, the, the, the medical field politely told them that washed their hands of Martin and said, there's nothing we can do. Uh, the best we know is he's got a degenerative neurological disorder, and they recommended his parents, Joanne and Rodney, to just put him in a care facility and let him die. Martin had traveled uh, without 
medicine, uh, and, uh, and he had, he traveled beyond what medicine could do to help him. He was lost in this place where no one could rescue him. The problem was Martin was completely and fully cognizant. He was only physically impaired. He was alive and well, but the world thought he was dead. He could see, he could hear, he could understand, but his body would not cooperate. He would scream and never make a sound. He would flail his arms and they wouldn't budge. He was completely entombed in this 12 year old body while being encased in concrete and tormented by memories. This was the world that Martin lived in every day. In the morning, his father would take him to a care facility where he would watch cartoons for hours on end. They'd set him in front of Barney and he would watch it for hours until he, he, he exclaims that he was angry at Barney. Martin's father would pick him up and bring him home every day. This went on for years until 2001. Martin is now 25. He was taken to the Center of Alternative Communication at the University of South Africa. Here he was given special attention of one nurse who specialized in rare degenerative muscle diseases. Verna Waltz spent every day with him and watched him closely. And it didn't take long for Verna to realize that there was a boy trapped in that tomb. That there was a boy trapped in that body. He, Martin remembers the moment she looked at him square in the eyes and said, I know you're in there and I'll spend the rest of my life working until I free you from that tomb. After daily medical treatment for years, muscle massages, aromatherapy, Martin began to regain control of his motor functions. Then he began to regain muscle memories. Then he began to regain speech control. Little by little, Martin began to resurrect into a vibrant, full of life that he had departed from so many years ago. Martin recalls one particular moment at a dinner table. His, his family is there and his mother looks across the table with tears in her eyes and she says, I just can't take it anymore. Martin's drooling out of the corner of his mouth. His brothers are there, his dad's there. And his mom says, I wish you would just die. Martin says, you have no idea what it feels like to have your mom look you in the eyes and tell you you'd be better off dead. She pulled and pushed away from the table. She ran to the bathroom and she attempted suicide because Martin's mother couldn't handle the pressure. They rushed her to the hospital. They pumped her stomach where she had tried to overdose on painkillers. They were able to save her life but did not save her from the mental turmoil. She suffered every day knowing that her son was trapped in that body somewhere. Martin says in the book, he says, I wanted to scream to my mother. Don't bury me. I'm not dead yet. I know I look lifeless, but there's a heartbeat in there somewhere. I know it looks over, Mama, but don't give up on me yet. And today, Martin is married. He lives in London. He works a full-time job. He's still suffering from some limited mobility, but he has fully recovered into a fully functioning, normal life. And Martin's story screams to us that, that there are some things that are meant to die. And when they die, you bury them and you let them go. You don't uncover them. You don't dig them up. You don't revisit them. You let them go and you let them die. There are too many well-meaning, wonderful Christians that are here tonight under the sound of my voice. And you'll worship and you'll pray at the altar. But when you get home in the stillness of night, when nobody's there with you, you unbury those things and you relive the guilt. You relive the sin. You relive the past. Instead, you've got to do like the Apostle Paul. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which you... Those things which are behind me, and I'm reaching for under those things which are before me. They say, they say old habits stop, but don't let that stop you from 
If you get a chance kicking that old habit, it may die hard, but you better fight it because if you don't kill it, there's a good chance it's going to kill you. And I'm not sure what it is for you. It may be your doubt. It may be your jealousy. It may be your shame. It might be your condemnation, but you've got to let it die. You've got to stop believing the lie that it's just the way you are and it's the way things are always going to be. That's a lie from the devil. You've got a God that will work with you. You've got, a, you've got a God that will go beside you, that will stand with you. You've got to kill it. You've got to bury it and you've got to let it go. Your sin will not go down without a fight. It does not want to die. Sin wants to negotiate. It wants to find middle ground, establish a peace treaty, and concessions and compromise until everybody gets what they want. But you don't need to live your life like that. You need the complete abolition of sin. You look in your Bible, particularly the book of Leviticus, the God gives specific instructions to the priesthood. When you prepare an altar, you have a sacrifice. I want you to tie it down. Don't just set it up on that altar, but I want you to tie the sacrifice down. Because animals are not the smartest things, especially bullocks, goats, whatever sheep. They're not the smartest creatures in the animal kingdom, but they know enough to know that I smell something burning and it smells a lot like me. And so the closer that sacrifice gets to the altar, the deeper that sacrifice digs its heels in and tries to resist being sacrificed. That's why the apostle Paul said, there is a war in my members. I'm gonna tell you what you gotta do. You gotta grab your flesh by the nap of the neck and drag it down to this altar. You may not wanna be down here, but you're gonna be down here. You may not wanna give up that relationship, but you're gonna give up that relationship. Because it's either you or me, somebody's gotta go, and I refuse to give in to the concession of the adversary. Except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die. It abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. It's not just enough to be alone with God. It's not just enough to cry about it. It's not just it's not enough to just feel bad about it. It's not enough to just get emotional about it. But you've got to be motivated enough about whatever you're going through to let it die. And as soon as you let it die, that's when you can become fruitful. There are some things that are meant to die, and when they die, you let them die. But there are some things that are not supposed to die. And somebody's got to breathe life back into it. Somebody's got to breathe life back into it. Your past was supposed to die, bury it, and let it go. Your addictions are supposed to die, you gotta bury them and let them go. Your failures and mistakes were supposed to die, you got to bury them and let them go, but your prayer life was not supposed to die. Your desire to reach this city was not supposed to die. Your consecration to the kingdom of God was not supposed to die. Your, your belief that God's gonna save your family was not supposed to die. Your fire was I can hear them tonight. I can hear your prayer life saying, don't bury me. I'm not dead yet. I can hear your lost loved ones tonight saying, don't bury me. I'm not dead yet. I can hear this city saying, don't bury me. Big old, big old six foot three, 
about 125 pounds, had a stroke. The whole left side of his body's paralyzed. The island gave up on him. The family gave up on him. His community gave up on him. Said he's as good as dead. We might as well bury him, but not the church. See, the church, we could hear a little heartbeat left. We, we looked in those eyes and we said, there's a little something in there. And we're not going to stop until we free you from that prison you're living in. So you know what we did? We started carrying Edward food. We just walked up his stairs and brought him food. And then we carried him a Bible. And then we carried him a Bible study. And then you know what we did? We carried him down those stairs. And we carried him into the water.
It's just me. But I'm just going to tell you, I live this every day. I, I've got to live by faith. I don't have a fallback plan. When we had a lady come to church last week, she said, I've got cancer, Pastor. What am I going to do? There's no chemotherapy. There's no doctor. All she's got is the church. That's where we live. But I believe God can heal you tonight. Here's what I want us to do. It's just me. If you need a miraculous healing in your body, I want you to come right here on the left side of the platform. Miraculous healing. Headache, hangnail, cancer, leukemia. I don't care what it is. I'm just going to tell you God can do it right here. 